as someone who's got, you know, the religious credentials, religious people know that I'm not against them. They know that I'm not belittling their beliefs. And therefore, they're more likely not only to listen to what I have to say, but they can be encouraged by it. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm taking some advice from Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, when I asked him about what I should, who I should interview, he suggested I step across the aisle a little bit and expand my horizons, talk to a religious person who is also into science. And so that's what we're doing in this episode. I'm going to pick the brains of a religious uh, leader who is also uh, pro-science and find out what makes him tick. Why? How does he reconcile uh, these two seemingly um, antagonistic beliefs? As always, if you enjoy what you're hearing, please press like on your podcast app. Share it with your friends. Love to hear from you on our Facebook discussion group, The Rational View. Brother Guy Consolmagno, SJ, is a Jesuit brother, director of the Vatican Observatory, and the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, whose research studies meteorites and asteroids. He's a native of Detroit, Michigan, received SB and SM degrees from MIT, and earned his PhD in planetary sciences from the University of Arizona in 1978. Along with more than 200 scientific publications, he is the author of six popular astronomy books. In 2014, he received the Carl Sagan Medal from the American Astronomical Society Division for Planetary Sciences for Excellence in Public Communication in Planetary Sciences. Welcome to The Rational View. It's a delight to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming and joining me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this interview, kind of reaching out beyond my usual base of, uh, of guests. You are originally from Detroit. I am from originally from Leamington, Ontario, right across the uh, river from you guys. So we were neighbors. <laughs> yep. Have you been back recently? Um, boy, not for a couple of years. I've been nearby. I've been to Michigan, but I haven't been to Detroit. I don't have any family there anymore. My brother's up in the UP, so I've been there this past summer. But of course, with COVID, you know, I was trapped in Tucson for a year and a half. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I've been back uh, several times. The the north shore of Lake Erie has really changed since I was a kid. Uh, It's it's now covered in wineries, uh, whereas before it was just uh, apple orchards and and corn and tobacco and stuff like that. (laughs) So... You are a scientist and a religious person, and I want to explore a little bit about uh, how these things come together. Uh, as an intro, could you give our listeners a brief overview of your current scientific research? What's your, what are your interests scientifically? Right. My big field is meteorites and their connections to the asteroid belt, and I've been working on that on and off for about 40 years. Uh, what I do now is I work with a small team of four of us, Three of us happen to be Jesuits, and that's almost by accident. And we make measurements of the physical properties of meteorites. Now, a lot of people do the chemistry of them, but fewer people have been measuring their density, their porosity, their magnetic susceptibility, their uh, thermal properties. And I started out as a theorist. I started out making computer models of how asteroids would evolve, and I realized I needed these data to make my models Mm -hmm. work and nobody else was measuring them. Um, First time I actually tried measuring them myself and presented it at a meteoritical society meeting, one of the grand old men of the field came up and said, Guy, why are you doing these measurements? Nobody does that. And (laughs) that's why I'm doing it, you know, come on. Uh, It turns out, once we started doing it, that a lot of people have adopted our numbers and have found uses for them that we would never have thought of. So it turns out it's a pretty important thing to know how the asteroid belt was put together to be able to compare the density of an asteroid, which we can measure with spacecraft, and the density of the meteorites that come from the asteroid, which turn out to be different. Because the asteroids are not solid bodies. They're rubble piles. They're 50% empty space. I see. And the meteorites then are more dense than the asteroids because they're the chunks. 
uh, that They're get the blown off. Survive, and then, coming through the atmosphere, yeah. Uh, very interesting. So you collect meteorites and you have a laboratory where you go and test them and and this laboratory is in the Vatican? It actually is. Um, we're actually out in the Pope's summer home. So we're in Castel Gandolfo, which is oh, about 20 miles southeast of Rome. We're up in the hills. It's really beautiful. You don't get all the tourists. You don't get all the smog. And, you know, it's just a phenomenal place to do work. But there was a collector in the 19th century, the Marquis de Mois, and he collected them the good old-fashioned way. He bought them. He bought them from dealers all over the world. He okay. donated a number of them to the Vatican around 1910. And then when he died, his widow gave us the bulk of his collection. So that started out a thousand different pieces. And it's a collector's collection, so it's a little bit of everything, which is ideal for the kind of work we're doing, because you can do a ser- survey of all these other different types. Hmm. That's very cool. So tell me a little bit about your your, your path in your career. It's, it's rare to find someone with a strong calling in both science and religion, in my experience. What what inspired you? What came first, and, and how did you get to, to become a Vatican Observatory Director? <laughs> It was not by planning, trust me. Uh, It was a bizarre path. Frankly, neither of them came first. Um, I was fascinated by science from as early back as I can remember, and I was fascinated by religion as early back as I can remember. Um, Both of my parents, you know, were Catholics. My dad was Italian, my mom Irish, so that came with the territory. But they're also both college educated, and even my immigrant grandfather from Italy was college educated and a lawyer, so education was a big thing. I went to um, some great schools in the Detroit area. They, you know, they give you standardized tests, and there were seven kids in my class who tested 99th percentile in my wow. seventh, eighth grade class. I went to That's the Jesuit high school there. <laughs> where, you know, 20% of the Jesuit high school class that I was in was in the top uh, two, you know, national merit semifinalists, top 2%. So mm-hmm. I was always surrounded by really smart people, and that was great because I never stood out. I was never bullied. I was just one of the gang, and I was never the smartest kid in the class, which is, you know, a great relief. <laughs> but I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, as a Sputnik kid, I grew up during the space age, and astronomy was really exciting. But then the Jesuits taught me classics in history and Latin and Greek and writing, and I loved that. So, you know, where can mm. I use all of it? I didn't know. I went off to college, uh, to a Jesuit college in Boston, Boston College, and I discovered that this was 1970, and, you know, the world was crazy, and all the guys in the freshman dorm wanted to do was to you know, drink and smoke pot and do crazy things, and I was a nerd. It just didn't look like fun to me. You know, I was, um, I was a hedonist. I wasn't going to do anything if it wasn't fun. And getting stupid drunk and spending all my money so I could throw up the next morning didn't seem like a really rational thing to do with my life. <laughs> so I knew I didn't fit in. And my first thought was, well, I, you know, join the Jesuits. They'll give me a job. I won't have to put up with these people. But then uh, one of the Jesuits I talked to said, you know, have you prayed about this? I'm thinking, I'm 18 years old. Who prays? Yeah, give me a break. Oh, I guess <laughs> that comes with the territory of being a priest, right? So, you know, I go to my room and I'm sitting on the floor and I'm waiting for this voice from God to tell me what I'm doing with my life. And needless to say, nothing's happening. And I'm feeling really foolish. Mm-hmm. And then the thought occurs in the back of my head you know, what does a priest do for a living? What's their day to day job? You know, on Sunday, they tell everybody else how to live their life. I can do that, yeah. But the rest of the week? Well, I guess their job is dealing with people. You know, people Mm -hmm. with problems. Mm -hmm. People like the guys in my dorm who I can't stand because I've got no talent dealing with. Oh, either there is no God and I haven't heard anything, in which case it would be stupid to be a priest, or that was God telling me it would be stupid for me to be a priest. But either way, the answer was to not join the Jesuits, to not be a priest, which was not the answer I was expecting. So the next question was, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm not happy here. 
My best friend from high school was at MIT, and MIT had weekend movies and pinball machines and the world's largest collection of science fiction. Ah. And I'd go every weekend and hang out and read science fiction. I thought, this is a great place. And it was full of nerds <laughs> like me who wanted to learn things. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, I'll take a flyer. The worst they can do is tell me no. And they told me yes. They admitted me. I was totally shocked. I wasn't expecting that at all. But I was so incredibly happy when I was there. I knew it was someplace where I belonged. The only problem was that I had checked off a box, Earth and planetary science, seeing the word planets, and ignoring the fact that that was actually the geology department. And, you know, rocks. Who could be more boring than rocks? Just <laughs> rocks all day. Dirt and rocks. Until, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, except there was this charismatic professor there, John Lewis, who taught the meteorite class. Meteorites. Rocks from outer space that fall on the ground that you can actually go and pick up and make measurements on and you're touching outer space. What could be? I couldn't get enough of it. And that Mm. started my lifelong passion for working with meteorites. So I stuck there. Um, I wound up doing a great program. I see this theoretical modeling program where I wished I'd had the data on meteorites. Uh, It was so good. He said, stick around an extra year. We'll give you a master's. So that's what I did. And then he said, there's this brand new program in Arizona called Planetary Sciences. And so I was one of the very first students at that program, one of the very first in the world to be getting a degree just in planetary sciences. Wow. And I loved it. I was really good at it, and there was a great program to be at, and it was a lot of fun. I didn't much care for Tucson. Tucson was kind of hot and dry and full of, you know, cowboys and Indians imagery which wasn't what I was into. So I had a chance to go back to Boston and uh, be a postdoc first at Harvard, then at MIT. I was five years a postdoc. Any of your audience who knows the academic world knows that five years a postdoc means you couldn't get a job. <laughs> and I was it's almost, it's almost regular now to get five years of postdoc before you can get yeah. a job. You know, six, six, yeah, well, nine. Even more, yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly the world has gotten even worse than this was 40 years ago. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I was feeling frustrated. And, and the other thing was, I'd be lying in bed at 3 in the morning wondering, why am I worried about, you know, meteorites and the moons of Jupiter when there's people starving in the world? Mm. And I didn't have an answer for that. Mm-hmm. So I thought, I've got no future in this field, and I don't even know why I'm doing it. And I'm, I'm pushing 30 years old at this point, which feels incredibly old. So, you know, I'm turning 70 next year. What did I know? I thought, I'll join the Peace Corps. I'll do some good in the world. I'll have adventures traveling. And then maybe I'll figure out what it is I want to do. Ooh, and so I okay. signed up. And once again, they took me to my surprise. I was in Africa. And I was, you know teaching in high schools, and that was fine. But then they said, no, 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 you've got a doctorate. You've got to go to the university. I could have done that back in Boston. Well, all right, if they want me. But I had all of these other Peace Corps volunteers I was with, and they all had places up country in the real Peace Corps. So I'd go and visit them on the weekends, and I'd bring a little telescope with me, because I was a nerd, and I had a little telescope, and I liked that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'd set it up, and everybody in the village wanted to look through the telescope. And look at the craters on the moon. And look at the moons of Jupiter. And look at the rings of Saturn. Have you ever seen the rings of Saturn in a little telescope? Indeed, yes. Have you it's ever, a lot of fun. Yeah. Have you ever looked at them and not gone, oh, wow? <laughs> no, no. Because that's it's... what you do. Because that's what a it's human amazing. being does. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, of course, that's, that's, a, that's what great to show do. it off, too, to to people that have never seen it before. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, Yes. And they're showing it off to each other because that's part of the fun of it. And then it hits me. This is what makes us different from just well-fed cows, that we've got this passion (laughs) to know more, to look at things that you wouldn't otherwise see, to wonder, what am I doing in this universe? What's it all about to engage my brain? Because, hey, I'd read this someplace. We don't live by bread alone. Uh, It's literally true. They needed their imaginations stoked. Hey, so did I. And they were stoking my imagination. 
It made me fall in love with science all over again. I came back to America, got a teaching job at a small college, Lafayette College, and I loved it. But I wanted to do something a little bit bigger than just, um, you know, going after my own career, going after my own glory. Now, at the time, two of my Peace Corps friends were getting married, and I was really happy for them. But I realized the life they were going into, that really wasn't what I wanted. You know, I dated people, and it been okay. And when it worked, it worked great. And when it didn't work, it was miserable. Mm-hmm. But what did I want? So I went back and did that prayer thing that I had done when I was 18. And I remembered back when I was at the Jesuit high school, there had been a Jesuit brother, not ordained, not somebody whose job was to deal with people, but whose job was academic work. And I thought, I could do that. So I went around and started asking my friends, you know, including girls that I dated, including uh, friends of mine who are not believers, including friends of mine who are deeply believers. Um, They all said, of course, that's who you are. That's where you belong. And that was a shock. So I applied to the Jesuits and I entered thinking that I was going to be teaching at a Jesuit school teaching physics. They accepted me, and as soon as I arrived, it was a funny thing. I'd been a happy person before, but for once I was a content person. That I had that sense that I was where I belonged. Hmm. And I'd never really experienced that before. So I was on my way, did the, the philosophy training. Philosophy, once you really start studying it, is really hard. Because there's a lot of content there that's not obvious to the scientific mind. You've got to break out of the unspoken assumptions that have narrowed the way that a scientist looks at the world and say, there are different ways of asking these questions. There are different questions to ask that you wouldn't even think to ask. That was exciting. Mm. This whole new realm of knowledge that had been closed to me before. Uh, Theology was a lot of fun. Because it felt like science, we're stumbling around trying to understand something that we know is so big and so complicated and so beyond us, we'll never understand it completely. But it's really fun when you can get your hands on a little bit of it and go, okay, at least I know what this is all about. And I was all set Mm -hmm. to teach. Well, you know, as a Jesuit brother, I have the same three vows that the priests have. Poverty, well, I've been a grad student, I was used to that. (laughs) <laughs> and chastity, well, I've been a grad student. I was used to that. <laughs> but obedience was the tough one. They mm. gave, I gave them the right to tell me where to go, what work to do. I wanted to teach, and they said, no, we're going to send you to Rome. You're going to have to look at that boring Italian scenery and eat that terrible Italian food <laughs> and work full time as a researcher at the Vatican Observatory, where, by the way, there are a thousand meteorites. Did I talk to you about meteorites? Have I mentioned yeah. how passionate I was about meteorites? That sounds like a so tough assignment. <laughs> oh, really tough. Really tough. And I did that for, you know, nearly 20 years. And then, uh, actually, 22 years. And then Pope Francis tells me that he's going to make me the new director of the observatory, which is not anything that I expected. But uh, hmm. here I am. And I'm having the time of my life. Interesting. Okay, well, that's that's quite quite a story. <laughs> so <laughs> I expected you, th- you thought it was going to be a three-sentence answer. Uh-uh. The world well, is not like that. that. That, that's very interesting. I, mean, I understand your, your, your sense of contentment when you found, you know, the path that worked for you. I, I mean, I think that's a, a common challenge that a lot of people face is to find something that interests them and also makes a difference in the world. I think, you know, to put those two things together and find something that, that hits both of those things is di- very challenging and it took me you know oh my gosh, yes. I'm continuing on that path all the time <laughs> yeah. well, it, and it never ends you know you, you, you keep having those questions and you keep reinventing yourself uh, my, mm-hmm. I, my father was my hero all my life and he lived to be a hundred 
And he was still wow. having to reinvent himself even in the last years because the pe person he was when he was young and vigorous at 60 or 70 or 80, he couldn't be at 95. So that the, the challenge never goes away. So I want to explore a little bit more about this, um, the contrast and, and how, how do you reconcile uh, your faith, your belief in the supernatural with your scientific training, um, you know, which is an exploration of the rules of the natural, of the, of the universe. How, how does that come together in you? And how do you, a lot of people find a conflict there when they start exploring their beliefs. Uh, and typically there's, you know, two different realms that are incompatible. How, how do you manage that? Well, a lot of the trouble comes from people being afraid of having their faith challenged, including their faith in science. But if you're going to be a scientist, you always have to be open to the fact that you don't know it all already, and what you thought you knew is going to be incomplete. As it happens, it has never been the case that my faith told me one thing and my science told me something else. That just doesn't come up. It's the nature of, you know, what... The word supernatural to me doesn't mean that there are ghosts out there messing around with the laws of nature. You know, if there was a ghost or a nature god messing around with the god of nature, that wouldn't be supernatural. That would just be another bit of the natural. And I don't think they're there. So for me, supernatural means outside or supporting or different from, you know, the, the, the answer to why is there something instead of nothing. And I don't just mean a vacuum. I mean, why are there laws of physics? Why is there a there? But what I'll tell you what does happen to me is that this bit of science contradicts this other bit of science. And when that happens, I get really excited because I know I'm about to find something that I'll get to write a paper about. As I explore the two of them and learn that this mm -hmm. really only applies in this situation and this really only encapsulates, but they fit together this way in a way that I would never have guessed before. Mm -hmm. So, number one, you're not afraid of contradictions. And number two, you don't think that religion is just this big book of facts, nor is science this big book of facts. You know, that's the way we teach it. You, you, you pass freshman physics if you can get all the answers in the back of the book. But freshman physics is not physics. You know, any more than learning how to play the scales is learning how to play music. So, what is your concept of God? You... Your, you, you need to have a particular concept that doesn't uh, challenge your understanding of, of science. Uh, oh, in fact, I need, a challenge. I need one that does challenge my understanding of science. I live on the challenge. I want the challenge. So uh, my flip answer is, to me, God is an old man with a long white beard sitting in a chair because I know that's so ridiculous. I'll never get fooled into thinking that's really God. <laughs> Just as my idea of an electron is a little silver ball with a negative sign painted on it. There sure. are times when that's a useful image, you know, the little ball bouncing down the wire. And mm -hmm. there are times when I know electrons are a whole lot more than that. But my real operating picture is somebody who has set up the puzzles of the universe and is looking over my shoulder as I play this game, going, yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're getting colder, you're getting colder. Now, yep, 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 isn't this cool? Isn't this wonderful? And will leap for joy when I discover one of the little Easter eggs that are in this universe. And then who will say, okay, let me show you the next bit. This is so cool, you're really going to love this. Okay. So y your concept of the supernatural, as you, as you say, is not an active interventionist uh, God, you, you don't see God actively intervening in the physical universe. Is that um, fair? Yeah, because the trouble with intervening, you know, is somebody talks about, oh, that's the thumbprint of God. And you only see thumbprints, I mean, I'm an effort astronomer, I can see a thumbprint on my lens if it's clean. But in fact, if the lens is totally covered with thumbprints, I'm not going to see one more. The universe is so absolutely immersed in this uh, imminent God that it's all thumbprints. The God who is also imminent is transcendent, is 
different from the universe. So I'm not worshiping the universe. I'm worshiping the fact that this universe exists because there is an answer to the question, why does something exist instead of just nothing? Okay, so it, it's you feel that God is maybe responsible for setting up the laws of the universe and you know, but creating also the conditions of the universe. But at every moment, but, but also, certainly that, but that creation is not just something that happened 13.8 billion years ago at the Big Bang. It occurs at every point, at every time, because God is outside of time. So God's creative action is at all places and all times. And this is a medieval idea. This isn't anything original with me. You can find this in Aquinas. Interesting. Uh, so do you believe in heaven and hell? Is, are those concepts that have a place in your theology? Do I believe in black holes? I've never seen one. But uh, I know that the pictures that we have of black holes, as naive as they are, are useful to explain the things I do see. Um, I don't believe in God because I'm hoping that I'm going to get a ticket to the nightclub in the sky when I die. That's not what's motivating that belief. But I do believe in love because I've experienced it. And also the lack of love, which, you know, frankly, is pretty lousy. I do believe in beauty because I've experienced it and the lack of beauty which, you know, helps remind me that beauty exists. Hmm. And that means that at the end of the day, even though I can't put words on what it is or what it's going to feel like or what it's going to be experienced as, I believe in a meaning in existence. That's what keeps me up at three in the morning. And I know, just like Wittgenstein says, a chair only has meaning because there's somebody who's not the chair sitting in it. A universe only has meaning because there is something other than the universe that allows it to have meaning in relation to it. Yeah, I think um, meaning is is one of those very objective things that we bring to our experience. Um, and maybe I'm totally wrong. Just... You know, I could be completely wrong. I could be mm. so totally off base that uh, my life is a total lie. And that's always going to be the case because we're talking about things that are beyond rational proof because every rational proof depends on unspoken axioms. So I've chosen to say the axioms of a creator God who's actually in a personal relationship with me is the starting point. Assuming that that exists, what does the universe look like? And I like the way the universe looks with that axiom. It's consistent with everything I've seen in my science and everything I've seen in the rest of my life. And so I'm happy with that assumption, and I'm happy to see where it's going to lead me in the future. Because that assumption isn't one that answers everything, but it's one that gives me a starting point to try to answer or to try to come up with better questions. That's um, a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, it allows you to experience science maybe um, much more uniquely than the mass majority of people who consider themselves religious. Um, a lot of people, a lot of what you see, especially on the internet, uh, you see, you know, scriptural. What fundamentalists. you see on the internet is, of course, not the truth. <laughs> Here we are, you and, and I are on the internet. Right there. there's, a, there's a vast <laughs> swath of interpretations of yeah. religion because yeah. it's subjective. Everyone has their own concept of religion. Why do you feel your personal interpretation of scripture is better than that of the fundamentalists? <laughs> what, you know, yeah. how, how, do we, how do we determine which subjective interpretation is the correct one? That's, that's a great question. You know, why am I not a fundamentalist? And I'll give you an example from science. Um, I'm an astronomer interested in the orbits of the planets. I'd love to have a way of understanding and describing the orbits of the planets. Well, Mr. Ptolemy, 2,000 years ago, came along with a system that said, let's assume 
that you've got a circular orbit around the Earth and then a circle within the circle and then a circle within the circle within the circle. And if you've studied Fourier's theorem, you know with an infinite number of circles, I can match any path that there is. So Ptolemy's system can give me a perfect description of every possible way that planets might orbit. But it's sterile. It doesn't lead me to anything new. Kepler's system, saying that planets go in ellipses, is only an approximation because it neglects the fact that there's other planets out there perturbing things. But even though it's only a pretty good approximation, it leads you to Newton's laws of gravity. It leads you Indeed. to a deeper and more exciting and more fruitful way of looking at things. And so I think that's the fundamental flaw in fundamentalism, that it's sterile, that it thinks it has the answers and it stops looking for any more. Yeah, the, um, you know, the movement from Ptolemaic system to the Keplerian system is also a great demonstration of Occam's razor, right? You have a theory that can explain um, observations with fewer parameters, and it's much more elegant, uh, in, from, from my perspective and from most scientists' perspective, it's the elegance yeah. of, of explaining yes. something with a simpler paradigm. Yes, yes. Even but if it's not course, more exact at the first application, it's much simpler in a generic but, but sense. But you see, simple, simpler is in the eye of the beholder, as is elegance. You know, uh, I, I hang, out, hang out at MIT. I knew my, my, uh, a number of friends on, on the spectrum, as we say. And there are those who are very puzzled when you say paintings of Elvis on black velvet playing cards with dogs is, is you know, not an elegant picture. Well, why not? It kind of looks cool. It's, well, <laughs> how much of that is taught, how much of that is learned, and how much of that is objectively, I'm sorry, that's hideous. You've made a statement in the past. Uh, and I was looking through some of, the, some of your work. You said that the opposite of faith is certainty. I found that to be a very wise and uncommon <laughs> observation. Oh, it's very you wise, and it's not mine. <laughs> it's not mine. It was a woman named Anne Lamott who came up with that one. So I only steal from the best. There's a couple of things going on here. There's the first obvious one, the one that she was making, which is if you had certainty, you wouldn't need faith. Indeed. Um, I'll tell you the, the, the joke of the, you know, the, the, the preacher on the waterfront with his uh, followers. And he says, if you have faith, then I can walk on the water. Do you have faith? And they all say, we believe. Do you really have faith that I can walk? Well, we all believe. And he goes, well, if you all believe, I don't have to do it. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And, and that, I think that attacks the fundamentalists at where, yeah. they, where they come but, from, right? But it also means that... Um, you use you, you wind up relying on faith when you have inadequate data. And let's face it, most of us in most of our lives are making decisions on inadequate data. I mean, who was the guy who decided that I should go to MIT? This 18-year-old who, you know, was an idiot. He happened to be me, so I know he was an idiot. And yet, on the basis of inadequate data, I wound up, you know, in not a bad place. But here's the other thing that goes with it. If you have certainty, then you stop looking. If you have mm -hmm. certainty, then you stop trying to understand what does it mean I believe in God. If you have certainty, then you stop trying to understand, well, what actually is gravity? You know, it, 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 Newton got away with it by saying, I, I feign no hypotheses, I have no idea. All I'm doing is telling you that it obeys these equations. That's not mm -hmm. good enough. Mm -hmm. Einstein comes up with a way of dealing with it. Is he right? Well, it doesn't match what we call dark matter. So either there's more matter or there's a different law of gravity. And at this point, um, I know which side I'd put my bets on, but I wouldn't be too shocked if it turns out I was wrong. Are you going, are you going to let us know? Um, I'm not you know, in the field. I'm an outsider, <laughs> so I'm naively going to stick around with, yeah, dark matter is real stuff. <laughs> and uh, Einstein's law of gravity has worked pretty well so far. I'm but there you. will come a time, you know, when we find out that it's an incomplete description and we got to go further. At least I hope I there will be a time. The, your, your description of, of 
faith versus certainty and the naive certainty of the fundamentalists and the literalists, the biblical literalists requires no faith if they're right. And they're pushing this as, you know, we're right. The Bible is literally true. You know, Bishop Usher's chronology is correct. The earth is 6,000 years old. All of this BS that makes Where does people that come that from? think about things. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I think I do. Because I, I can see the temptation in me towards that. And it comes from fear. It comes precisely because they don't have faith. They're looking mm. for certainty because they're afraid. And, you know, if you've got the picture of a God who's a stern taskmaster who's going to who's looking for an excuse to send you to the other place, then you're going to be filled with fear. The same is true of the science fundamentalists. The ones who, I mean, Carl Sagan, in, later in his life, uh, one of his students told me, said, an atheist is somebody who knows more than I do. And I you know, can't argue with that. In order to be sure that there's no God, you have to have a really clear idea of the God it is. You're sure it doesn't exist. And there's a lot of gods out there I don't believe, believe in either. But the people who want to push themselves as, um, I'm an atheist, not because I've struggled with it and that's what makes the most sense, or the gods that I've seen so far don't make sense to me, all of which are perfectly honest and uh, you know, understandable answers. But if you're saying it because you want people to think you're smart, you want people to think I'm not like all those other people who you know, come from my socioeconomic background, um, I'm better than that, I'm different from that, that comes from an insecurity. And, hey, I'm full of insecurities. Never met a human being who wasn't. But um, I also came from a family and a socioeconomic background, blah, blah, that gave me the courage to wear my imposter syndrome in a different way. So that, yeah, I know I'm faking it, but rather than being afraid that the world is going to find out that I'm faking it, I'm laughing behind my back at, look at this. I get to write, publish papers. Don't these people realize what an idiot I am? And, you know, I'm having the best time of my life. In my view, I mean, I understand what you're saying about atheism um, requiring a certainty that is, is difficult to, um, to justify. I mean, for a long time, I've thought agnosticism is the only uh, logically consistent position that one can have. You know, faith requires doubt, but then embraces a conclusion uh, in the absence of evidence. Uh, which, from a scientific training point of view, a skeptical approach is appears to be personal bias. And from you know a scientific background, you, you're trained not to embrace personal bias. Certainly, we have uh, everyone has personal bias. Everyone wants to pursue an idea, and and you know this is the pursuit of science, in my opinion, is, is pursuing an idea uh, in the absence of evidence, but being open to the fact that you're wrong. And you've said that yourself, you are open to the possibility that you're wrong. How does that work with faith? Well, let me give the example of, you know, deciding to go to MIT. If I were truly agnostic about it, of course I didn't know if it was going to be the right place. And I knew at the time I didn't know. But at the end of the day, I had to decide, am I going to you know, submit the application or not? And after they accepted me, I had to decide, am I going to go or not? And too often, agnosticism is being afraid to make the jump because the data is inadequate. At the end of the day, you've got to make some decisions about who am I going to be and who am I going to be to the rest of the world. Um, it's fascinating to talk to people who come from very rational, very wise backgrounds who uh, wind up embracing theism. Uh, there was a woman, Raisa Maritain, who was uh, a Russian Jew, came to France uh, before World War I, and so was raised in that heavily uh, intellectual milieu. And she became a theist, as she said, because of the evidence of holiness, that she saw that there were good people. 
just as a lot of believers are bothered by the problem of evil, if God is good, how can there be evil in the world? She was problem, bothered in the opposite direction. If there is no God, how can there be good in the world? And yet she saw good. And then you have to say, all right, does this require a decision in action on my part? Knowing that I could be wrong. Uh, going off and joining the Peace Corps. You know, I probably did it for 50% of the reasons I did it for were foolish, but they were enough to get me there to begin to, begin to learn the things I needed to learn when I was there. And that also means that you can't be judgmental of anyone depending on where they are on that journey, where they are in their lives, because none of us there all the way yet. And um, the sad thing, again, the thing that acts out of fear is the action that says those people, whoever those people are, um, and I can really believe those people are wrong, but they're people. And they're acting from the same set of desires and fears and wanting to do the right thing and being afraid of doing the wrong thing that causes them to do what they do and it's 50%, you know, how they were toilet trained or what their background was in their families. But in spite of that, it's also 50%, I believe, free will of deciding, I don't care. This is who I'm going to be. I find, or in my in my perspective, that a lot of the, um, there, there's been on a recent, recently, uh, an uptick in um, atheist uh, speakers who are, uh, you know, strongly, uh, militantly atheist, I guess. And I feel like that's a response to, you know, the church's weak record in support of the sciences and the upswing of fundamentalism. You know, I, I feel like one is opposing the other, like the, the fundamentalists feel they need to impose their views on the science classroom and you know, outlaw ev- the teaching of evolution and, and replace it with creationism, especially in the U.S. One, one of the uh, ironies is that uh, for a while it seemed like the only place you could teach evolution was in the Catholic schools. <laughs> you know, we don't have any problem with evolution. No. That's that's something that's not, I think, well known. Do you feel a, a need yeah. to defend the sciences amongst the religious community? That's why I've got the job I've got. That's exactly the job I have. As someone who's got, you know, the religious mm-hmm. credentials, that religious people know that I'm not against them. They know that I'm not belittling their beliefs. And therefore, they're more likely not only to listen to what I have to say, but they can be encouraged by it, um, including people who were you know, fundamentalists and you would think would be anti-Catholic. They're happy to see science. Look, if you're putting together a museum of what you're going to call creation science, which you know, to you and me looks a little odd, but notice they're using the word science. They still want that cachet. They still want what science can offer, you know, the, ultimately with the root of the word, knowledge, wisdom. We're all looking for that. Um, In some cases, I think they're looking in the wrong places, but I got to respect their journey as well, as long as they don't stop looking. No, that's that's good. I I think that you know that sort of a a message needs to be amplified and and spread around, and we need to you know show the fundamentalists you know. It's kind of a gish gallop when they attack science. They're basically just poking holes in science to try mm-hmm. to defend their bad theology, as far as, as far as I'm concerned. And what we need and, and, from and of course that, that's how it happens with the fundamentalists, with you know the, the so-called new atheists. Again, they're poking holes in the real weak parts of the goofiest kind of fundamentalism, and thinking that they're attacking religion, just as the fundamentalists poke holes in the bits of science they don't really understand. It's likewise, you know, they, they, and part of the sadness is that that's the kind of debate that winds up on the Internet. Those are the people who are going to be trolls because nice people aren't trolls. People who are more interested in learning rather than showing up the other guy, they're not going to be trolls on the Internet. They're not going to show up on television trying to, you know, sell their books. Something that I've... Um found through my travels and my learning experience is that 
it's very easy once you're in an echo chamber to caricature an opponent. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot of fun to poke holes in that caricature and knock down as a As long as you're surrounded by people who are going to be laughing, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, that guy there who's my friend, I've just really hurt. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. Well, you know what? You mm-hmm. shouldn't have said it that way even if he didn't hear you. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I was a scientist, you know, 20 years before I decided to become a Jesuit. And when I enter this religious order, it's like, you know, coming out of the closet as a churchgoer. Because you never talk about church when you're in the science. Because I assumed I was the only one. And what shocked me was over and over and over again, people who I had known in the scientific world goes, you know, you go to church? Let me tell you about the church I go to. And I go, you go to church too? There's two of us? Especially in, I think, astronomy and physics where we're faced every day with recognizing that the universe is stranger than uh, our rational minds can easily put into boxes, even though those boxes and those rational minds are all we've got at the moment. And it's the very rational minds that show us the limit of the rationality. Um, You know, biology is still trying to figure out where the gears and levers are. And I totally understand why they're still in a sort of a 19th century mechanistic view of the universe, because biology is a whole lot more complicated than physics. But Mm -hmm. that being the case, among the astronomers and among the the theoretical physicists I know, there's a great openness to a wide range of theological beliefs, theistic beliefs, agnostic beliefs, and... I think it's different than it was even 30 years ago. I think, you know, frankly, the young atheists of my experience are as embarrassed by Richard Dawkins as I am embarrassed by, you know, some of the the crazy fundamentalists out there because they don't do justice to the real struggles we're all having trying to figure out this universe in our lives. I do enjoy listening to Dawkins. He's very uh, well-spoken. Uh, puts forward some some very thought provoking arguments, um, but uh, he hasn't come on the podcast yet, so I haven't been able to uh, <laughs> to discuss with him. <laughs> right. Well, I'll tell you. You know, a, uh, yeah, a the, friend of mine, one, one of the people who has been on your podcast, who's an old buddy of mine, is Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I love oh, Neil. Yes. Really, and okay, great. I really, I love the way that he is so dedicated to promoting astronomy. Uh, one of the real eye-opening moments, I, about 15 years ago, I had a, a year sabbatical in New York City at Fordham University, and I would go once a week to uh, the Natural History Museum to work with their meteorite specialists. And one day, going up the front door, there's Neil on the street chatting with a couple who just sort of randomly talking to him about astronomy. Wow. And he wasn't sort of, I'm so important, I don't need to talk to you. He says, let me tell you about astronomy. Because he's passionate about that astronomy. He does a great job. And he does a great job of it. Where he slips up is thinking that he can talk history of astronomy with the same authority. That, you know, his his understanding of the Galileo affair is, is so naive. I mean, the truth about Galileo doesn't make the church look any better, but the mistakes we made were not the mistakes that he thinks we made. Mm-hmm. And... And that's partly not his fault. I think that's partly the boxes that the people who give him the platform want him to be. And it's tough to fight against that. Indeed. Indeed. So before we sign off, this has been a great discussion. I really enjoyed talking to you. We should, we should do this again sometime and, and, and explore more uh, of this because this, this, is, you know, this is what people need to hear, this sort of rational view <laughs> which I'm trying to bring to, uh, to counter the, the sort of echo chambers that have yep. divided people. We need to break out of these echo chambers and we need to talk across the aisle and realize that people that we are caricaturing are not are not as foolish as as they appear to the uh, uninitiated to the people yeah. without the gray beards <laughs> <laughs> but you know we, so we're, we're in the season of, of thanksgiving and christmas maybe when we meet families at the dinner table we can uh, if not agree with those people who voted differently from us 
we can at least listen to what are they afraid of? What yes. bothers them? That's important. Maybe That's part important. of what the problem has been that nobody's been listening to them in what they're afraid of. Indeed, that, that's that's key. Listen to listen with an open mind to people's fears, yeah. and you know, talk to them. Talk to them mm-hmm. really, in, and don't talk over them. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an important thing. What what are you willing to give up of your beliefs if you're asking them to give up something of their beliefs? There's a scary question. Mm, indeed, indeed. And that's worth uh, worth discussing, I think, uh, yeah. over a beer in yeah. a pub somewhere. Yep, yep. You've that's mentioned uh, an interest in science fiction. Mm-hmm. Have you read The Sparrow? <laughs> People either love that book or hate it. It's, it's this book about Jesuits in space. And uh, I was one of the ones who was never able to finish it. Every I get about halfway through and throw it up against the wall. Uh, my trouble <laughs> with it... My trouble is that the Jesuits that she have has aren't the Jesuits I know. The Jesuits I know would be laughing their tails off at the things that you know terrify this guy because she's created characters that seem to have no sense of humor. The odd thing is that I know people who know her who say she's got a wonderful sense of humor, but I think she was afraid to give the Jesuit characters the, the ability to laugh at themselves. The ability to recognize, hey, I don't know what's going on. So this was recommended to me by a previous guest. So I, I just wanted to get your opinion on on, on whether it was a, a, a good description or not. So you, you don't like it. I didn't like it, but I know people who love it because it raises lots of fun questions. And you can't blame a book for that. What, what's your favorite science fiction? Space opera. Goofy space opera. Stuff that pulls me out of my world and makes me look at a completely different world that I can have a lot of fun with without being too worried about it. Because you know, I do deep and heavy for a living, so I'm looking for popcorn. Uh, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller have written a zillion books in a universe that is silly and ridiculous and gets everything wrong, and I can tell you because I've read all of them at least three times. <laughs> nice. Very good. Well, that is something I'll have to look into as well. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the Rational View. I'll, I'll send you a Rational View T-shirt if you like. Uh, Absolutely. We'll get your, I, I, get your I take a look after this. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. All right, it's great chatting with you. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at the Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.